One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. Welcome to another exciting edition of Security Guy Radio. Brian, uh, what's with the theme music there? A little skipping? Uh, what was that? Did you bump it's the needle? Vaughan always brought one of those Vaughan. Well, Brian is uh, a music aficionado, and uh, a, a young lad is he, but uh, he kind of digs the vinyl stuff. And I think he must have played that on an old vinyl record with the needle. Is that what you did? Because digital music does not skip during a live radio show. Is that correct? Uh, that, that was me loading up the other sounds. I see. Okay. That's all right. No problem. No problem. You're still a cool guy, dude. Well, welcome, Paul. And you. Welcome, Chuck. Chuck Harold. What, what was I last week? Chuck the Chin Harold, and uh, you were Paul. Tally Ho Bristol, oh, which I still am. I still like that. Actually, Paul, Paul Tally Ho Bristol. So, what, uh, what's going on? Anything on the weekend? Anything happened exciting? No, but I was uh, very pleased uh, last week to see that Jim McDonald had uh, announced that he was running for LA Sheriff. Oh, that's so fantastic. I think, I think we're going to support him uh, as yeah. much as we can. Yeah, he's yeah, a good he's guy. Good. He is a good guy. Very he's, good guy. Uh, if, for those that don't know, he's uh, currently uh, chief of Long Beach. I uh, think was LAPD. I think it'd be better for him to go outside. Instead, instead yeah. of go inside with yeah. the internal chef, sheriff. Do you want a, do you want a quick uh, Jim McDonald um, story? I, I, su- had? I suppose we do. So I was in uh, I was in Boston on my travels one 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 time, and uh, if if anybody's ever been to Boston, there's a bunch of one way systems you can never find your way out, and they were doing construction, and uh, I was driving around and around and around, couldn't get back on the freeway. Finally, found a copper. And started to talk to him, and he was standing in front of this construction in the freeway. And he saw that I was wearing an LAPD shirt, which I do for protection, right? Uh, And he said, do you know Jim McDonald? Because he used to be uh, in Boston. And I said, yeah. And he said, I love Jim McDonald. And then he escorted me through all the construction and onto the freeway so that I could get where I was going. So Jim McDonald actually probably saved me from driving around for another three hours if I in wore Boston. An LAPD <laughs> shirt, I'd have a, a a cap busted in my ass or something. <laughs> yeah, so good yeah. for, well, LAPD with the accent, you sort of get away with I it. I think it's your yeah, accent. Yeah. I think that's the entire thing. Yeah, but that's my Jim McDonald story. I can't put on an Irish yeah. accent, unfortunately, because that, your Irish accents beat the British accents every time, of course. Oh, yeah. 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 The chicks yeah. dig them. Yeah. yeah. And Scottish. Scottish, that's right. Yeah. Well, today we're going to have... A discussion kind of following what we did before for this month, which is Stalker Awareness Month, but this is going to segue into workplace violence, which could include a stalker, of course, right? But I think we want to get down to something that's really kind of specialized for you and me because at Fox and Disney, we have both had these databases, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, of stalkers, which translate sometimes into workplace violence. Yeah. And for many, many years... People didn't know what to do about it. And for many, many years on the radio and the TV, people said, well, you just can't predict when somebody's going to do something. they got to go off. And you always said, and yeah. I always said, <laughs> bollards or bollocks or whatever. So it's <laughs> yeah, nonsense. Yeah. It's nonsense, right? <laughs> because there are incident indicators. There's background yeah. information and things like that. So I think it's important to get this out to the general public, to get it out to the soccer moms and the professionals at the same time, to let them know that there are things you can do. Because workplace extends from the office, the studio, the house. Absolutely. The house yeah. is the workplace for a family, right? And you yeah. can have the same issues. So we're super duper fortunate today to have what I think is probably the top the top guy in the field on that. I believe so. Absolutely. <laughs> Mr. Well, Patrick so, so he tells you anyway. That's Mr. Right. Patrick Prince. Welcome, <laughs> Mr. Patrick Prince. Uh, my pleasure. Now, I'm going to read this because <clears throat> I can't remember it, but this is it's a little long intro, but I, got, I want everybody to understand that Mr. Prince is – the genuine article. Yeah. He's the guy, right? So Patrick is with uh, Princeton Phelps, Phelps Consultants. It's a corporate training and management consulting partnership specializing in workplace violence. And what's kind of unique is, unlike many other consultants in that field who study cases, in other words, it's academic, they read about the case and they say, well, you know, I would have done this and so on. Uh, Pat and his partner have actually been out in the field and on the ground and with the troops and in the trenches actually consulting on real cases. And they've done over 1,500 cases of uh, threatening situations or acts of violence in the workplace. And there are a wide array of situations ranging from hostile intimidation, harassment, verbal threats to physical assaults, act of sabotage, felony stalking, discharging, discharging firearms in the workplace, and some uh, on-the-job homicides. Uh, 
they were the principal responders to several incidents, which you've all heard about, including the workplace violence homicides at the United States Post Office Dana Point, that was 93, the city of Los Angeles Piper Tech Center, 1995, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Potter Valley, 1998, city of L.A. Bureau of Fleet Services, 2005. Now, in addition to this, what's really significant, and Pat, you're going to get into this right away, is that he's federally certified as a drug recognition expert. And uh, I, w- I think I, I was a DRE at Culver City back in the day. It was not as high yeah. end, but it's a super important component because he's also a reserve officer with LAPD and has served as an instructor with the DRE program since 1997. He also instructs LAPD's narcotics schools and other specialized training. And he's recognized as an expert in the articulation and application of reasonable cause for workplace drug testing. Trained over 10,000 supervisors, right? Lots and lots. Lots. lots and, a lot. and over 12,000 employees have attended drug awareness. And the reason I spent some extra time on that is because as we go on this discussion, you're going to understand how important your workplace violence program, uh, how important it is to have your workplace violence program include drug recognition, drug testing, things like that. So after that, I'm exhausted. Welcome, Pat. Well, thank you very much. Thanks it's for coming on the show. So today I thought we would kind of break this down into some components Let's talk about where workplace violence was, where it's gone, and where it's going. I mean, great. Well, we've we've seen a lot of movement. Actually, you know what? I want to I want to jump back to where y'all were last week. Many people don't realize this: forty percent of workplace homicides are really domestic violence cases coming into the workplace. Forty percent. Mm-hmm. When you started off talking about stalking, and then if some people try to put a line between stalking, domestic violence, and the workplace, uh, they're fooling themselves. So. This, the, the transition from stalking to workplace violence is, is dynamic, is huge. And frankly, that's where many of the folks in my line of business, uh, we got our start. I was very fortunate. I got my start back in the early 90s. I was doing what we were calling trauma response. I was working mostly with electrical utilities, and, and we would assist companies when there was a, a fatal accident. In the 80s, was a really tough decade for, for a lot of our electrical utilities. And uh, we were doing death notifications. We were having to notify women their husbands were dead and try to figure out how do we restore services, how do we get people back on their feet. And then one of the utilities I was consulting with had an employee murdered on the job in, in early 93. And, and that forced us to not only then provide assistance to his family, but it forced us to ask ourselves, what is this thing called workplace violence? How is it somebody comes to work and doesn't go home and a shift? And, and you know, we, we, 20 years later, we read the paper, we, we watch stuff on TV, but it's still remarkable yeah. conceptually. Somebody doesn't go home because of another person's intentional behavior. Fan, uh, fascinating, it's horrific, really. I think uh, what was uh, maybe the the uh, the big point and and maybe the turning point in my career was only a few months after that homicide, there was a shooting at the Dana Point Post Office. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was asked to come and assist the Postal Service. I spent uh, weeks and weeks working with the management team and the employees, and we were really forced to look at workplace violence. And subsequent to that, uh, everyone hopefully is aware the post office has really done some remarkable mm. things in developing their Yeah, there has been a, a shooting with a postal. Well, work you know, that was kind of the 90s thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. um, well, you know, going it, postal, right? Going there's postal. the term. And not yeah. fair because they had no higher incident of shooters than other. No, they had. I, actually, there's one. Catchy uh, phrase, though. Yeah, one one yeah, particular news mm-hmm. team that uh, liked me. I was, I was on fairly often in the in the early '90s until they asked me. So what's wrong with these postal employees? And and I wasn't willing to throw them under the bus because frankly I didn't think they deserved any yeah. more discredit than than, right. than anybody else. It's horrific. They'd gone through enough. I never got invited back. Oh. So <laughs> it's good enough. Uh, but no, but that's, we started, that's the news business. For it you. is. <laughs> but we started to really pay attention, and and the and we didn't have many tools back then. Even if we were to go back and look at my first big shooting, the Dana Point, it was actually a stalking case. Uh, a a fellow named Mark Hilburn mm. was stalking a, a female coworker named Kimberly Springer. We hear about labor management. We heard about it certainly there. It was a stalking case. Yeah, I don't think most people realize that it was a stalking case. No, yeah. it, we I thought it was a crazy employee. That's it. That's right. And and yeah. uh, mind you, he had problems. Right. He yeah. was yeah. a poor employee. Yeah. Now the challenge was back in 1993. Most employers only had one or two tools. Let's see, we had uh, fitness for duty evaluations, yep. and we had uh, admin leave. We could put people off. Absent those, m- companies didn't know what to do. Yeah. The sad thing was the post office did both of those, but those weren't enough. They needed to have a, a plan B, I guess, and um, I don't think that they were inadequate in what they did. They did the best they knew how. We were inadequate in helping them. Was and termination so- not one of the... 
tools were, for him? He well, was reluctant? Again, how do we translate aberrant behavior into uh, actionable um, conduct on the work in the workplace? Frankly, actually, what you're, what, you're, what you're bringing up is a huge issue. If we start to go back, as you said in your opening comments, and pay attention to behavior, what we find is that we probably could have taken job action. We probably can take some sort of intervention with many of the folks that, that just continue to get worse and get worse and then act out that what we find is often maybe years earlier they were doing stuff hmm. they were creating fear they were creating distress and they weren't really sure what to do and uh when i first started with, with the uh, actually with the department of agriculture after a, a shooting that we helped them with in 1998 i heard the federal government does two kinds of um, evaluations for their employees they do performance evaluations and conduct and i thought that was the screwiest thing until i really started thinking about it it's not just how skilled somebody is how do they conduct themselves mm. what's their conduct how do they interact with others how well do they do uh, the things that they do and many companies fall into the trap if they're skilled they're good but if they're scaring their coworkers, right. they're not interacting yeah, yeah, yeah. well. Yeah. They're they're doing all those other kinds of things that we now you know accept as warnings or flags or whatever yeah. we're going to call them. We can do something there, and that's I think one of the more significant con contributions we've been making is let's do something early. Don't wait until it's abundantly uh, yeah. obvious that we can take action. Right? Is weird a terminable offense? And you know, uh, in many yeah, cases, yeah. weird is not. Yeah. Thank God, Paul. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Paul. Yeah, I don't Paul have a job anywhere. <laughs> Although we are doing a radio uh, show, yeah, so yeah, possibly yeah. there is some uh, kind yeah. of correlation there. But yeah. no, I see what you're saying. I mean, a job action. You know, everybody's worried about getting sued, and they're worried about uh, you know what's going to happen. But if the guy is an excellent worker and proficient in his job, but he wears weird T-shirts, people or, are going to look the other way and say, "Well, you know, he's okay. We'll leave him alone." When they should be really looking at. The web of circumstances and all its behavior. You bet. And 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 it's not just the T-shirts. It's the uh, let's see. Do y'all remember? And I didn't work the case. I was in Hawaii when it happened. The young fellow committed the uh, acts of murder for Xerox, and he killed I think nine of his coworkers. What was interesting was they had years of stuff leading up to it, where he would uh, when he'd go to clients' uh, business, he'd sit in a chair and stare into space. They'd have to call up Xerox and say, "You need to call your guy in." He he was uh, hard to be around. Um, there was rumors, uh, eventually things came out later, that he would go to the range. And, and, you know, most of us that have guns like to shoot. We see somebody at the range who's got a lot of guns and they're proficient. We like them. Yeah, yeah. Other people at the range stayed away from him. He made them uncomfortable. When you make folks at the range uncomfortable, <laughs> yeah, when uncomfortable. you scare clients, <laughs> yeah. it's a clue. It's a clue. It's a clue. Yeah. And, and so was he technically proficient? It appears so. Was he a, quote, unquote, good employee? No way. And, and I think what we, we go back and look at, the cases I've worked, the cases we read about, there were opportunities for HR to intervene. There were opportunities for management to do something rather than wait and wait and wait. What do, what do you think about uh, sort of fitness for duty examinations? Because, uh, I mean, I've always been concerned about that. I, I've know, got two major issues. with. First of all, I don't like them off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah. Uh, they, they are a tool with very limited application. Hmm. I, I, here, here's the problem. A fitness for duty evaluation is asking whether or not a person is fit. Do they have the ability, medically, psychologically, to perform the essential function of the job? And I don't want to diminish anybody's job, but look at what we're doing. We're talking to microphones. Yeah. This isn't hard. Yeah, yeah. Now, whether we actually do it or not is another issue. The sad truth about fitness for duty is that most people who are evaluated on fitness for duty are going to be found fit. Hmm. Or they're going to be found fit with some uh, uh, restrictions. My favorite of all time. Somebody was sent. He was scaring his coworkers. He sent off the job. Uh, he was returned to work with two restrictions. No contact with the public and no <laughs> contact with supervision. <laughs> oh, it's a dream job, first of all. I want that yeah. job. Uh, that, it didn't serve the employer. He is psychologically able to do the job means nothing as far as whether or not the person's dangerous. So the challenge we have is that was the only tool we had in, our, in, in the workplace yeah. for many years. We used it. It was a very poor tool. I actually worked a shooting where a fellow was causing concern, was, was sent off the job for fitness for duty. I was called in because he'd come in and committed multiple homicides, killed a number of his coworkers and some people outside the job. During our 
re- recovery efforts as we were working and, and helping the company out. The manager took me in his office. Look at this. He showed me a letter from the psychiatrist that they'd sent him to saying he was fit for duty, should be returned to work. He was able to do the job means nothing on whether they're dangerous. Mm. So quite frankly, I'm not a big fan of fitness or duty. The second issue, it often tends to medicalize bad behavior. There's no excuse for bad behavior. Don't medicalize it. Interesting. Medicalize. That's a very interesting way to look at it. Yeah, we try not to medicalize it. If they're not performing well, let's take action. If they're performing fine, then we let them work. Yeah, yeah. Hold that thought, Pat. We'll be back in a few minutes on Security Guy Radio. Okay, Trevor. Where's the big dip? Over there. Trevor's a space whiz, and he's battling a brain tumor. He came to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, where our pioneering research helps save kids with brain tumors across America. How many stars are there? <laughs> That's easy. One, two... Get out of here. <laughs> give thanks for the healthy kids in your life, and give to those who are not. Donate now at stjude.org, or shop wherever you see our magnifying glass. Five billion one, five billion two... <laughs> Good morning there, Ruckus. What's going down with you? It's Pep and Dre of the Real Sports Dogs here on Adrenaline Radio. Catch our show every, every Saturday, Saturday morning, morning, 9 to 10 on Adrenaline Radio, 1680 AM. That's family-friendly programming. It's a sports wrap. Put a bow on the week that was in sports. Sports banner at its, it's finest. finest. Coming to you live every Saturday, 9 to 10. That's the Paperboy crew here on Adrenaline Radio. Wings! <laughs> Thanks for asking, but I'd rather not send you nude pictures. I'm camera shy. I already said no. Under my clothes, I'm a robot. My webcam is broken. I'm worried they'll get passed around school. I have a rash. I have nudophobia. I have lizard skin. I'm a vampire, so I don't show up in pictures anyways. Your badgering has really killed the mood. When someone is pressuring you to do something you don't want to, how many ways can you say no before they get the message? Let us know at that'snotcool.com. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Just a sec. Hey. Hey. Ready to go? What? There's a swarm of locusts flying just around you. No, there isn't. What? Okay. Yeah, there is. You ready to go? I didn't even know there were locusts in this part of the world. I know. I was busy throwing rocks at stuff, and then swarm of locusts. Maybe the universe was trying to tell you something. I tried bug spray, but it just made them mad, and the fumes made me sick. Sounds like bad karma. Maybe you should volunteer, help a little old lady across the street, something, get your uh, karma right. Karma? <laughs> All right, that's that's just dumb. Ow! Stay on the universe's good side. Volunteer, vote, get involved, and get yourself to getgoodkarma.org. Getgoodkarma.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hello, this is Rod Stewart for Rad. Your lifestyle is your business, but when you drive drunk, you become everybody's business. Don't drink and drive. Be smart, plan ahead, and choose a designated driver. Remember, music lives, and so should you. A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, Rad, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Security Guy Ready with Chuck Harold, Paul Tallyho Bristol. Paul Tallyho Bristol. How would we gone for cheers? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and come up with a different nickname every show. <laughs> that they're drawing. No, I'm going to stick with that one. I'm okay. <laughs> I right, were talking to uh, Pat Prince, the guy in workplace violence assessment. Uh, we were just talking uh, in the previous segment about kind of the history of workplace violence, how people thought they couldn't do anything about it, HR would wait till the threshold of behavior got to a point where it was outrageous, and then they'd start thinking about doing something about it, and they either put them on a fitness for duty or uh, leave. I mean, there wasn't much much else they could do, right? And I'm always I'm not a big fan of putting somebody off on paid leave. If you want to pay somebody to stay home, pay me to stay home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I have uh, found though in our, in our cases, when I say termination, we don't always terminate people because they're going to be workplace violence. But let's say they're a little weird, they're a little eccentric. But you know what? Paying a guard 
couple hundred bucks for the week to transition into another job because a guard can get a job in about a day. Mm-hmm. So for paying for two or three days, and it and it mitigates some of that problem. I found that that is. Do, do you not find that it gives you a little bit of wiggle room now? Just a little bit of. Yeah, you how, know, how we let people cushion. go. Yeah, one of the you things know. on my resume, and it's, it's not real highlighted, but I, I've, I've worked with a number of folks on what we call hostile terminations. And some folks need to be terminated uh, for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, and poor performance, uh, unwillingness to work well with others. I mean, there's a bunch of things. When I often get a call from a client, uh, I think they worry that I'm going to say, well, don't terminate them. If somebody deserves it, we need to take yeah, admin really. action. But yeah. a lot of it goes back to how we do it. Yeah, exactly. And, and um, I don't mind throwing a couple of weeks worth of pay at yeah. somebody if it, if it eases them. Uh, you know, we can debate whether they deserve it or not, but whether it makes the company safer or not, it's cheap. And that's what, it, that's what it's, it's all cheap. about in the yeah. end, right? That's right. That's it's all that, yeah. So and each no case is individual. Yeah. They really are. Uh, and sometimes we just walk them right to their car. Sometimes we, we make a little softer landing. We try to f- understand what is in the, the safety's best interest, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Yeah. The worst termination I had was I was doing consulting for, uh, let's just say, a big postal meter company. And uh, the guy we're going to terminate knew he was getting terminated. He came to work. And I, for some reason, I just, the hair on the back of my neck said, i I, I got to check this guy's trunk. I didn't check it when he came in. I should have. But we saw him coming mm-hmm. from the parking lot. But I says, leaving. I said, well, you got to check your trunk. Make sure you didn't take anything. Full of automatic weapons. I'm talking rifles, two or three rifles, shotguns, and uh, that was a prime lesson in looking at these people and saying, you know what, you never know what you're going to get. You got to be careful, and you got to treat them all the same way. I, you know, I actually uh, assisted a company up in Northern California. It was uh, a fella who it was in a representative uh, union environment, and so they had some reluctance. Um, although we went to the union and said, look, he's engaged in this behavior. He was the guy who's sitting in the lunchroom. And uh, out of the blue one day, he says, you know, what? if I was to come in here and shoot everybody, you know how I'd do it? And he says, I'd sit on the, you know, the bridge <laughs> across the street. And I have a scope. I could pick you off. And he started naming who he'd shoot first, who he'd shoot second. And that's a little inappropriate. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then as they started looking into it, somebody went to HR with that. And then they found out, well, you know what? He'd had years of, of, of staring people down, you know, making the, you know, the finger like a gun when they walked through his area. So we actually approached the uh, business agent for the union. It's a big union. And uh, he says, well, you know, we, we'll, we'll represent him. But the only discussion I've had, this is a business agent, he said, I came in one day and said, hey, you know, nice to see you as one of our members. I never see you at the meetings. And the guy says, the only time you'll see me at a union meeting is when I come in and kill you all. <laughs> well, like, so did yeah. the union all you? Yeah. So, yeah. so he so says that to you? management. He <laughs> says it to his coworkers. Says union. And, and so, you know, we needed it to help him out of the company. Yeah. Well, now, it's like, uh, you know, the famous line from the Terminator, I'll be back. Yeah. yeah. And I use yeah. that for training. Yeah. Yeah. Really? A cyborg walks in your police lobby, says he's going to be back, and you don't take him seriously. I mean, you have to treat those statements as real. Yeah, you just, just have to. You can't do nothing about it. Right. So let's go back. We we have the 90s. We have people getting shot right and left. All kinds of things are happening. And HR and legal are sitting around with their thumbs going, well, I'm not sure we can fire people. What changed? How did it get to a point where now we can do some evaluations, now we can take some action? Because it nothing happened for a long time. Well, I, I think what we did is we stopped medicalizing it, first of all. Okay. We stopped saying that it is acceptable conduct given their condition, whatever that is. And then, fortunately, the United States Supreme Court has agreed, and it's been a few years since their last uh, major ruling on this, but there's no excuse for bad behavior. If we as corporations focus on the behavior, if we as threat assessors focus on the behavior, what we can do is start to understand that there is action available to us. Um, you know, we, you briefly talked about it in an intro. Uh, go back and look at drug testing. Uh, my partner and I, we went back and we looked at about 100 of our cases. We looked at a, a, a fairly narrow time frame. And then we pulled out the files, and it looked to us, in probably 55 60% of our caseload in that one time frame, had the employer drug tested for cause, they wouldn't have called us. Mm. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's easier to take action on an employee for a positive drug test then they're scaring the heck out of their coworkers. Well, right. It's it's easier to fire somebody for lying about an investigation than right. for the actual thing you're investigating them for. There's always a different way to do it that's easier and better, really. You bet. Yeah, no, so let's talk about drug tests. I mean, what do we have, Paul? We had about a 10%, 12% failure 10%, rate yeah, when we were less. testing for, yeah. let's just call it the biggest event in Hollywood, uh, 500 people, 500 guards. Oh, 10% would fail. You think that might be low compared to some other? Frankly, I think, again, everything changes. 
we need to go back and look at some of the 80s and 90s research and into the early 2000s. I think of some of the companies we're seeing maybe up to 30% positive on pre-employment. Well, I think you were dealing with security officers, no? That's right. It's so different you are population. dealing with a different you know, set of hopefully set of a slightly better population. Hopefully, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And now, so we, you're we talking about just the average employee in, in any given business may have a thirty uh, percent at any one time. Thirty percent of them may have used or been under the influence of drugs. Well, I think that's in the old days. I think random testing has changed a lot of things, mm. and that's really only applies to DOT governed and law enforcement, and nuclear regular, and it's fairly narrow in its application. Oh, okay. But that's had that. What it did was it it, it unleashed the tools. And, you know, up until 1988, there was nothing really there in the way the Drug-Free Workplace Act. That didn't say you should test, but it said you can test. That was, that was good. DOT rules came in, at least it said for their population, you must test under certain circumstances, and four cause being one. Most employers have recognized that that adds to their tool chest. Yeah. When somebody's engaging in misconduct, now, when we go back, and, and, and I've worked with Paul for years, and, and we look at when we, when we assess a case for risk, we can come up with a fairly simple way, low, moderate, high risk of imminent danger. And there's other ways of putting it, but that, that's a pretty standard mm -hmm. way. If we go back and look at what I would call low behavior, low risk, it's still important. Uh, aggressive, belligerent, intimidating, uh, profane. We look at what we call low risk behavior, that's overwhelmingly substance related. That's, that's drug and alcohol mm -hmm. behavior. Really, on the low end, it, it's still and, drug and In my opinion, yeah, if we go back, what is... What do we test for? We don't test because I think somebody's under the influence of marijuana or cocaine. We test that they're impaired. Now, I've been testifying for a number of years as, as an expert witness in, in both public and private sector. Impairment, and uh, the way I define it, is they're not safe, effective, or appropriate. And that's been really accepted in, in the cases yeah. I've testified in. What's appropriate for this workplace? Not defined by the, the employer. You know, we all have that guy, Bubba, and we're saying, yeah, he's been kind of screwy for years. Right. Now, I don't care what's normal for him. I don't care what's normal for Pat Prince. I don't care what's appropriate for this workplace. It's defined by the employer. Mm. And cursing, yelling, intimidating, throwing things around the workroom, you know, kicking trash cans, threatening to kill somebody. That's inappropriate. Of course, now the problem is in a studio, that's completely appropriate behavior. Literally. Yes. No, well, I'm, I'm not kidding. Right, here, here's, I'm not my kidding. here's my studio story. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It Fifteen is. years ago, I got a call from one of the studios, and, and uh, one of their uh, nurses had said, you know, Pat, we saw you do this training on stuff. We'd like you to come in and do some stress training. And I said, really, what's going on? So we noticed between especially Thanksgiving and New Year's, we have a lot of absenteeism. We have a lot of just poor performance. We got, we got a lot of issues, and we think people are stressed out. And I said, it sounds like drugs. He says, oh, no, I know our people do drugs. This is a studio. We expect them to. They're creative. I'm going, well, okay, look, I'm a consultant. I'll kill, come in and do the training for you. But it was, it was substance-related. It was yeah. huge. So is that an objective standard? Is it what the employer believes is appropriate for his workplace? Or do you have to make it subjective and say, uh, no, I, I get that backwards. It's a subjective standard for the employee employer to say this is my place i say what's appropriate because in a studio running around acting crazy is completely normal and so that standard may may be different so if you're gonna do for well, cause or for random testing you know I, I, again the employer is part of defining what's normal people run around get a little crazy they do have some rights in that still the employer the employer has a lot of rights okay. um, i've worked with longshoremen i've worked with teamsters i've worked with uh, electrical workers represented by ebw the one thing i have been most gratified by is whether it's a union environment or not, people want an environment where they can come to work, do their job, yeah. go home. They don't want to be cursed and yelled at. They don't want to have right. stuff thrown at them. They don't want to be treated like uh, dirt. Now, not all people cursing and yelling are under the influence, but in my opinion, inappropriate behavior is inappropriate. And if we get a positive drug test, we go down one avenue. If it's negative, we go to another. If we don't drug test, we don't do anything typically let it get worse. Hmm. So this sounds... I think most people would think this is the drug test is the last part of the equation. It's really the start. And you're saying that behavior, what's called weird behavior, it's a simple way to say it, right? Not normal. You think that gives people, for lack of a better term, probable cause is not the right thing to say. But let's go reasonable cause. Let's give them reasonable cause to say, you know what, you're acting kind of strange. Who would act that way unless your behavior is altered by a chemical and then what we do is we go, it's not safe, it's not effective, it's not appropriate in this environment. And that's enough teeth to, to execute sure. a four-cause. See, I think a lot of definitions of four-cause are, like we've had, 
you're standing in the guard booth and a guy reeks like marijuana. That's pretty clear for cause. Although That's quite I, reasonable. Although I've had that argued, right? I've had sure. it argued. Yeah. Uh, but you're suggesting that employers really can say, you know what? Something's wrong, dude. Let's get in here and pee in the bottle and start the process that way. Reasonableness is defined as with two people with similar experience, background, education, training, considering the same facts or evidence, come to the same belief. Yeah. Two supervisory or two levels of supervision, considering the same behavior. And by the way, subjective doesn't make it bad. Everything is subjective. It's true. I'm okay with subject. That's why we hire managers. I want their subjective experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I trust their subjectivity. Now, I've never seen for cause drug testing abused. I've got to tell you, uh, there's a lot of other ways to mess with folks. If somebody's acting in a way that's not safe, not effective, not appropriate, drug test. Now, a lot of things can cause people to be unsafe. Stress, medical, uh, psychological, there's things. All right, if they're negative, we'll still pursue what caused the inappropriate right. behavior. If yeah, they're positive, yeah. well, we have another avenue. But if we're going to get a 40% hit oh, on drugs right. at the first level, let's do it. Let's Back do in it. a minute on Security Guy Radio. Hi, this is Ozzy Osbourne. For many years, you know I've had a drink problem and I'm, I'm trying to battle that problem every single day. But one thing I don't do, I don't drive my car when I'm drinking. I get someone to drive me. Do not drink and drive. It's the stupidest thing. If you drink, just don't drive. Not only are you going to hurt yourself, you may hurt some other person and you wouldn't want that on your conscience, would you? A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. At highway speeds, the average text takes your eyes off the road for about five seconds. That's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop texts, stop rex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. While cutting molding with a 12-inch dual compound miter saw, while holding a newborn baby in your arms, when face-to-face -face with a congregation of alligators, with the ball in your hands and the entire freaking season on the line, there are a million places you'd never consider texting. So why parents. would you do it During while driving? NASCAR driver Casey Kane here, asking you to please stop the text, and together we can stop the wrecks. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Get the message at stoptextstoprex.org. 7,000 high school students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. So here's a 26-second message of encouragement. I'm Matt. I know, sometimes you think no one cares if I finish high school, right? Well, I do. Me and thousands of people you've never even met. Okay, here's the thing. When you graduate, you have better opportunities to make more money, have a cool job, you know, just have a better life. So the next time you need a little support, a little motivation, just know there are a whole lot of shoulders for you to lean on. So stay in school and graduate. Do you have 26 seconds to convince a student to stay at their desk? Now you can share your message of support at BoostUp.org. We can keep students in school. Visit BoostUp.org and take the first step. Brought to you by the U.S. Army and the Ad Council. Tropicana Bakery and Cuban Cafe. Come and experience our sweet tradition of sweets, pastries, and incredibly delicious Cuban food. At Tropicana, we offer a bohemian, nostalgic-like atmosphere. In Spanish, we say, es la hora de tertulia de café, which is the moment of drinking coffee and having a great time with friends and family. At Tropicana Bakery and Cuban Cafe, we have an array of exquisite coffees. We have an array of desserts, of pastries, and empanadas, sandwiches, and Cuban food. Come to Tropicana Bakery and be blown away by the Caribbean-like atmosphere and flavor profile. Tropicana Bakery and Cuban Cafe is located in the city of Downey. The address is 10218 Paramount Boulevard, virtually on the corner of Paramount and Florence. Violent consultant extraordinaire, the yeah, guy behind the go. biz. So, just a quick review. We're talking about in the first segment the history of workplace violence and how, really, in the 90s, people weren't really sure what to do about it. We've gotten better at it now. You're suggesting 
drug testing is the first place to really kind of start because if somebody starts acting wacky, it's easy to say, you know what, that behavior to me doesn't seem proper. You must be on drugs. Let's do a test. And if we hit those people with a drug test very early on and we catch 40 to 60 percent of the people who are going to test positive, we're done. We're really done. Makes a big difference. He's fired. And by the way, I've always found that terminating people fairly goes a long way. The guy knows he's not going to be able to work well, with respect. on drugs. I mean, and the, respect. That's the biggest thing. And, and right. Yeah, from what I've seen, I mean, yeah. that doesn't take place a lot of the time. So, so I'm, re- yeah. I'm reviewing so yeah. we can kind of, as a listener goes through this, they can kind of see in their mind how we're building a workplace violence mm-hmm. program. We really are. I, I, yep. this way, you know? I, and I think, you know, the, one of the nice things, in my opinion, about where we've come in the last 20 years, workplace violence prevention fits into a lot of other things. It mm. fits into our EEO training. We don't treat people disrespectfully, inappropriately, unfairly. Now, some folks, just because I say you're treating me bad doesn't mean it's so. And we got right. a lot of folks who claim I'm being harassed because you're being asked to work. Yeah, yeah. So just because I say I'm being harassed doesn't make it so. However, if I truly believe it, let's pay attention to it. And if we can fix the conditions, let's do it. If we can't, then we better pay attention. Mm. What is this person going to do? Why do they truly believe that they've been so uh, harmed? And what are they going to do to protect themselves? So I, I think we, we start to integrate workplace violence into effective leadership, communication skills. Uh, I worked a shooting a number of years ago, 1995, one of the more extraordinary events, where a fella had actually shot and killed four of his supervisors. He put the gun in the pocket of his coveralls and was leaving the facility. Later, he's interviewed in jail and was asked, where are you going? And he said, I was going to leave, but I didn't want to give them the satisfaction of dying on their premises. But as he was leaving... In come from the loading dock comes another supervisor, been on a cigarette break. The fella takes the gun out of his pocket, puts it in the man's forehead, and said words to the effect of, I just killed four of the supervisors, I should kill you. But you always treated me okay. Yeah. You were fair to me. I think that's a big component. Are there numbers, studies, statistics on the correlation between the shooting and be it a distorted view of how a person's treated? Mm. Still, there's some reality in, in how they're treated. Yeah, I again, this is something I say a lot, and I don't, I think the data would support a lot of what we do is anecdotal. We don't really know because right. a lot of these things aren't aren't really uh, publicized well enough. I, I'd like to think that if we were to go back and look at the single most significant element that workplace and school shootings have in common, people feel they're treated unfairly. That's my gut. I and it's that. what they feel. That's yes, how they right. feel. Right. Now, they just, again, because they say it doesn't make it so, but yeah. uh, now there's other issues. Depression is probably another issue. There's a lot of th- factors, but if somebody truly feels treated unfairly they're going to act out on it then if just as you said earlier about if you have to let somebody go be decent be fair Mm. if it's extremely explicit you have violated this policy this is not as if we're trying to 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 ruin your life right it goes a long way so i think we need to look at at how people present the people who take umbrage at everything you know you're harassing me i just asked you to show up on time you're singling me out well, no, I just asked you to turn in your time sheet. I know when when you get that pushback of management, those things should start to create some concern. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we start to figure out what do we do. This gets back to, again, back to the 90s. One of the challenges, we had all or nothing. We put them on enemy leave and we get an eval or we leave them alone. Now we're saying if all we have is all or nothing, we're, we're in trouble. So let's start looking at other options. Early on, early in the process, we can look at everything from – uh, uh, management consulting, how do you supervise the supervisor, how do you coach, how do we look at work group interactions, we can even use EAP referrals, there's a number of tools. Later on, the high risk, I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes the best we can do is put additional security on the premises, we can surveil what they do when they leave our, our facility, we can follow them for a period of time, and hopefully until they get another job, get fired from it, and they're mad at them more than us. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but early on, I, and this is over simplistic early on. I think it's an HR opportunity. Later, it's ex- uh, almost exclusively security. And the truth is, most cases are in between. It's that relationship between HR and security that makes us safe. Do you find that uh, HR doesn't really have the the training? I mean, it, it's it sort of amazes me sometimes that I, you know, I go and see an HR department, mm-hmm. and they've they've got all the you know qualifications and such, but they've never done any training in violence in the workplace. Yeah, it astounds it, me. It, it is it is you know? it is remarkable because. The truth is, they're usually the first point exactly. of contact. Yeah. They are doing, they, whether they, they call it that or yeah. not, they're doing yeah. triage. They hear things. They get reports. And I'm interested in the person who files multiple complaints about being treated unfairly, the person who has 
other performance issues. The person who has uh, multiple counseling for uh, not working well with others. Uh, I got a call from this company in, in South Carolina just a couple of weeks ago where they have a fella who people around him don't want to sit near him. And when HR finally was asking some people, what's going on here? One of the, the, the men who sit next to him says, I don't want to be the first one he shoots when he comes in. That's a big deal. And, and mind you, comes, huh? it, it had to have gone a long time. So HR hears this, and HR says, well, what do we do? And, and uh, so back to your original question. HR often is, is under-trained. Uh, under mm. I think they need to recognize how powerful their impact is on the workplace. I think that HR, I, I disagree slightly, I think HR are the best people Oh, I think they're the best. I think we need to train them more. It, to recognize it. Yeah. I think they recognize it. I think most people, I, most of them do recognize it. I think they it. don't know what to do after exactly. that. Yeah. Well, That's my opinion. And yeah. here's what I used to yeah. do. I always wanted to be the first guy shot because I couldn't live with my employees getting shot below me. I had an open-door policy. People had my cell phone. They had my home number. And I had people call me up and bitching at 3 o'clock in the morning about how they didn't get their uniform pants. And guess what? That's fine with me. I let them vent. And I think there's some mitigation here. I think mm -hmm. this really does work. That if you can address these these grievances that people have and let them vent and keep it flowing and have an honest exchange, it does something. And then if you're fair about your response, another thing I used to do, well, you did this too. If you're writing somebody up that's starting to behave poorly and their behavior is not good, I have them write themselves up. Tell me what happened. They cannot come back and be unfair, f feel I was unfair when they wrote down what they did. I agree with it. I sign off on it and I say, what would you do if uh, you were me? What would your right. what would your penalty be? I think you. Sh I think I would fire you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to fire you. And guess what? They get it. Right. So there's all kinds of things like that yeah. you can do on a interpersonal level. Well, too. and that's respect. As it's well. all respect. So you might get them understand. You're not to lying to them. them. You're respecting them. Yeah. They get it. And I, I always felt that, uh, you know, if they're gonna shoot me, I wanted to know about it. Right. I want to know if you're really pissed at me. Don't tell me you're, everybody else you're pissed at me. Well, here's the good news. This is kind of getting off, but a lot of times what we'll do is we'll try to make sure that if somebody's angry, they're angry at the company. Or okay. we're going to, to, instead of making the first level supervisor the bad guy, I'm going to push it up the chain. How do you mm. shift it from being the supervisor to the company? Because well, a policy or something? Or? Part of it is, is when we do the, the termination interview. Uh, part of it is when we do the, uh, the severancing, is that we really look at them and say, look, here's the policy. Here's the direction that we've been given. And where possible... I'd rather have a manager they don't know come in the room and say, I'm, they, I know your name because it's on the org chart, yeah, but I've never yeah. gone up well, that high. Point. And have that person say, based on the information I have, based on our policy, based on your own admissions, here's what we're going to do. Um, now, some folks go off well into the night because they know it's right. Some folks, it doesn't matter how well we treat them, are, are going to be a, a concern. But it's easier to see them if we do all those other things, as Paul mentioned. You have to have an exit interview better. to really do the mm -hmm. evaluation. And I think a lot of people sometimes just, well, I just heard of a case. Uh, I forget who was telling me. They called a guy on the phone or terminated him on the phone. Because they're afraid of him. I've seen that done. Because they're afraid of him. It's the funniest thing. And here, here's where I think HR yeah. and security is, is ultimately the relationship that counts. I, I got a call a little while ago from an, uh, a security uh, company that I've done some consulting with, and they said one of our clients called us at 930 and they want additional security because they're going to fire a guy at 11. Now, he's already been put off an admin leave. They're going to fire him over the phone. They'd like you to listen in on the phone while they fire him and do your threat assessment. <laughs> and I said, I'm good. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> and I said, let's catch our breath. Let's slow the process down. If we can fire him at 11, we can fire him tomorrow at 11. Yeah. And what I would hope would happen is maybe three months earlier when he got his first performance review, when he was first counseled by HR that this is not acceptable behavior, that's when security gets in the loop. That's when that, that relationship starts to, to you know, share their yeah. eyes on this guy. Who's the, who's the team? I'm, I'm, in my experience, it's HR, it's security, it's the department manager, lawyers. Okay. Sometimes they muddle that up. Here, here's where we run act. into some problems. Right. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, about 2011, October, as is American Society for Industrial Security, partnered with SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management, published uh, national guidelines on workplace violence programs. I was in one of the many authors of, of that document. In it, throughout it, it talks about having a multidisciplinary team. What we didn't do an adequate job in that document, and what a lot of folks don't get is they're really, in the, in the real world, two teams. We have our kind of corporate-wide oversight team. 
I want security, HR, legal, line management, executive, uh, labor relations probably, and there'll be a couple other key players that look at overall policy considerations, do some overall case uh, monitoring and look at trends within the company. But when something goes sideways, when an employee at your plant makes a threat, acts in a threatening way, does something on the threat team, I want security, I want HR, I want management. You know what? Call me up, have a threat assessment professional, and maybe that's the team. Because when things start to get hot, a small team works much more effectively than a big team. Absolutely. And, and what we get caught up in is, okay, wait a minute, we got to bring all 19 people together. No, forget it. We're not going to have yeah. any kind of successful resolution. And you have no time to do that. No, no. You've got to act. And we'll talk about acting as opposed to sitting and doing nothing when we get back from our break on Security Guy Radio. Hi everybody, this is Getty Lee for RAD. To many of us, drunk driving is something that other people do. Certainly not one of our friends or relatives would do such a thing. When you see someone who's had too much to drink, about to get into a car, urge them to give up the keys and find alternate transportation. Always choose a designated driver. Remember, music lives, you should too. A public service message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. Hello, this is George Foreman. Nothing is as rewarding as making a difference in someone's life. Someone like Nathan, a four-year-old battling a rare blood disorder. The generosity of a blood donor like you can help save a life, and it only takes about an hour. The American Red Cross encourages you to give the gift of life through blood donation. You can make a difference, donate blood, and encourage your friends, family, and neighbors to give. Call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. That's 1-800-448-3543. And schedule your appointment today. Join me in making a real difference in the lives of kids like Nathan. And visit GiveLife.org. That's 1-800-448-3543. Call 1-800-448-3543-GIVE-LIFE.org. And, and, and learn more about donating blood. Los Pollos, home of flavor down to the bone chicken. As we say in Spanish, el sabor hasta el último huesito. At Los Pollos, we serve delicious Cuban slash Mexican marinated chicken. We are cooking our chickens in rotisserie ovens to give you a well-seasoned, well-marinated, well-cooked, delicious chicken. We have three locations to serve you. In the city of Bell, we are located in 6201 Atlantic Avenue on the corner of Randolph and Atlantic. In the city of East L.A., we are located on 5161 Pomona Boulevard on the corner of Atlantic and Pomona Boulevard. And in the city of Downey, we are located on 7940 East Florence Avenue in the corner of Paramount and Florence. Come to Los Boyles and experience the most delicious chicken that you'll ever have the pleasure of eating. Super Thrive, unique extra life, transplanting and maintenance. Impossibilities made easy. 1,860 to 75 year old trees dug up from grounds of 20th Century Fox Studios, stockpiled in weather for two years, replanted along city streets. The landscape architect and contractor reported not one sick or dead tree at any time. Only Super Thrive could have done this or even approached it. Super Thrive, ask for it by name at your local garden center or nursery. If you're an entrepreneur and business person, you know that without advertising, a terrible thing happens. Nothing. Increase your local, national, or worldwide sales by advertising right here on Adrenaline Radio. We have a sales rep that can custom tailor a campaign that will benefit both you and your business. Call 562-945-6469 before your competition does. That's 562-945-6469. Yeah, AdrenalineRadio.com. Welcome back to Security Guy Ready with Chuck Harrell, Paul Bristow, and Patrick Prince. So, Pat, we we want to try and build, I think, uh, let's, let's build a workplace violence team. Let's build a, a group of people. Let's put it together. Let's show the folks on, listening on the radio how we get this done. Because my frustration's always been that security knows 
what they're doing. They're all, you know, they're all a bunch of ex-cops. They can walk down the street and say, no, oh, that guy's robbing a store and that guy's going to do it. You know, we just know that from our training and mm-hmm. intuition. But when security walks upstairs to, you know, the guy running facilities who's in charge of security, who doesn't know anything about it and doesn't really care and doesn't want to know about it, and he says, go to HR, and HR says, well, I'm going to check with legal. It, it's very hard to get it done. It's hard to get it done. And then when something happens, it's your fault because you didn't get it done. So how do we how do we put together in a, in a corporate environment a team like that, and then how do we get people to act? Uh, huge questions. We could actually talk for, and this is fun. We could go on for a yeah. long time. The the first thing we do is we start to make sure people have a common understanding of what we're talking defining about. Defining the problem. Define the, define the problem. When we talk about workplace violence prevention, we really are looking at creating a safe work environment. We're looking at using a host of tools, whether it's HR initiated early on, mostly security you know owned later on mostly or kind of in between that we have tools within our tool chest that the company can use to solve problems and that's what i really think we do is we tell them we can solve problems how do you how do you do that i mean through training or uh, training is always the know, first part and yeah, you know there's you, a lot you got a security director sitting out there and he's got this problem i mean what what does he yeah. do yeah, well i would suggest you bring in you get your security director you bring in your hr director you bring in somebody from the executive suite who can make decisions, and you say, let's articulate what the issues are. I generally get called in after something horrific happens. Exactly, right. It's a very ugly thing, but when there's a major shooting, my business goes to the roof. My favorite clients, though, are the ones who call me in when there's nothing going on saying, yeah. I don't want it to happen. Yeah. I don't want right. to go down that path. So let's bring in legal, let's bring in HR, let's bring in security, let's bring in some of your line managers who understand the business, and let's start talking about how it is that this team can help them solve problems that interfere with productivity, with interfere with people's ability to focus on the job, which actually cost the company dearly. Low-risk behavior may not be homicidal, but we pay a lot of money every year for a quote-unquote hostile work environment, for people not willing to come to work, for a lot of things. So we start to articulate how it is that, that we can help the company. Who's the salesperson on that? Security? Uh, well, I think security is often going to be the one who, who opens the door. They drive it. Ultimately, I think HR owns it. I, okay. I think that, that ultimately, and we're seeing a trend in some of the major companies out there, this is should be an HR driven kind of activity because if we do our job correctly, they start to see problems early when they're not that big a deal. It's easier not easy, but easier to deal with something when it's a behavior of concern as opposed to a threat. HR owns that. That so we start to identify who in the company owns this. And I think HR is very, very good at that. The other thing that HR does bring to the table is a lot of times, you know, I, I've been a reserve officer for many years. I would like to say, well, let's arrest this one, let's kick him out. And HR says, we can't. And they're right, okay? Then I want to hear what HR says. I want to understand how we can otherwise administratively deal with it because if the only tool I have is dismissal or leave them alone, again, we, we've hurt the company. Now, there's a question. What, what's the motivator for getting these people involved? Is it liability? Is it? money if something yeah. does happen trying to or scare them or does it because the company actually cares about their employees which isn't always the case yes. well, well the answer that, should right? be hopefully all <laughs> the above right yeah. um What's liability always gets people liability. the fact that uh, as is insurance published these standards every company should be sitting down asking themselves do we meet at least the minimum mm. right and the minimum requires do you think training people know about those standards at this point probably not um, I've gone into uh, uh, environments where the HR directors I know are members of SHRM. They have no clue. I've, I've dealt with security types who aren't really sure. We need to make sure that everyone knows there's at least a minimum level that every company should be adhering to. And by the way, it's not overwhelmingly constantly. Yeah, right. Right. The consultants who are trying to, to charge you a, a, an arm and a leg for the service are, are taking your money. Now, on the other hand, don't buy cheap stuff. Yeah. You get what you paid for. Right. So what we want to do is start to under- show folks violence prevention fits into their company. It fits into effective communication, EEO-related kind of decreasing cost. It fits into to all the other initiatives they've already done. If they do it correctly, it enhances what they're already doing as opposed to, yet, oh, here's another program. we got to stick on top of what we're doing. It's not that overwhelming. It's and not I, that costly. And I think from what you said earlier on, it's actually a morale issue as well because the employees want to feel safe at their, at their 
where they're working. Yeah, I, I had a meeting last week with the manager who, frankly, is, is, is afraid to fire this fella because she, she's afraid he's going to come back and shoot her. And she's said it. So, and I understand. I appreciate that. Yeah. But I respect her concern. The question we had to bring up is, if you're afraid and you're the manager, how do you think the people around him feel? Yeah. W- how much money are you going to pay on their stress claims? How much are you going to pay on the fact that they don't come into work? We appreciate your fear. We appreciate the concern you have. Now, how do we take care of you? You know, that's an interesting approach. If she's the victim and she's in HR, she's blinded by the facts and she, she's paralyzed, right? Mm-hmm. And you remember this. W- we used to get the phone call that says, I need a box on the fifth floor. And the box meant somebody's going, yeah, yeah. right? And I have been asked by HR to do terminations, given company authority to say, I want you to go fire that guy. We're going to shift the hostility, like you said mm-hmm. earlier, off to the security department. And if the security department's firing you, it's because we think there's something going on. People can debate that that's a good strategy. It may or may not be in all situations. But I think sometimes they understand, like you just said, they recognize the threat, but they're afraid. Yeah. And they don't know what to do about it. And the other thing I think is you get into this territorial thing, right? Yeah. HR thinks that they run security. And security thinks they run janitorial. And janitorial doesn't run anybody. I mean, it's just the hierarchy, right? One thing i got to give Disney credit for, and Fox to some degree, was that if I picked up the phone and called HR, they were my internal consultant. They seldom told me what to do but they advised me what to do. And we worked as a team much right. better that way. Much, much better. If you're going to bring up a uh, threat mitigation team you want to build at, the, at the, the office, it has to be no pissing contest, right? Everybody's right. got to work together on okay. it and not, you can own it collectively, but then of course at the end, somebody has to be the decision maker and this is where we fall down. Nobody's the decision maker. Nothing happens. There's no act. And then we have somebody come back and shoot. I think of Fox, it was very good. Apart from occasionally you'd get, uh, an HR person that, that hadn't pushed it up the line anywhere. They you just know, held it, right? They, they just held it, they sat with it, and then all of a sudden, you know. Yeah. Uh, so is, I, H- I, is HR going to yeah. pull the trigger in your model? They're going to be the yes. decision maker? So if I were to come right? into a company, you know what I like to do? I like to have four or five people to meet with first. I want to meet with security, I want to have HR, and I want to have someone in senior management, and let's just sit down and talk about if a company is only looking at preventing homicide, a lot of times they say, it's not going to happen here. And thank God, they're probably right. Hmm. We're really looking at that whole range of behavior that, that distresses the company and costs them dearly. So our program is not just to stop homicide, although certainly that's our bottom line. Let's stop all those other kinds of behaviors that fall within this, this course of conduct that, that are relevant, and HR will get on board and security. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if it's an internal threat, a coworker, uh, uh, an employee, maybe even a customer, I want HR to take the lead. If it's an external threat, I want security to take the lead. Yeah, that's a good point. So before I walk out of any assessment, I want to know who owns this. Who's going to monitor? Who's going to follow? If you go back and look at Virginia Tech, there's been so much written about that. But you know the failure of Virginia Tech? Every one of the people that touched Sung Hui Cho did their job. Right, Nobody was designed to manage and follow up. Nobody took ownership. No took ownership, yeah. and no one followed it for the long term and i'll tell you what if you don't take ownership and do something it's the company and we're part of the company the employees will do something and case in point mm-hmm. there's a wacky guy in the workplace everybody's afraid of him i have had employees tell me oh, listen i got a ccw from so and so and i pack and i carry because that guy over there's a nut and nobody's doing anything about it so you're gonna have more violence oh. potential that's uh, right because you weapons know, in the workplace because right. people are going to take care of themselves and their own family first and they may not have the right tools that's to correct that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so what do you think about policies? You hear so, so many people say, well, we've got a policy. All right. right. Policy is a piece of paper. No, yeah, no I, I worked a shooting where a guy said, <laughs> I can't believe this person shot these people. We have a policy preventing yeah. it, prohibiting <laughs> it. <laughs> he signed policy. it. Yeah. Now, policies are nice, and I've seen companies write a policy and they move on. No, you know what? I'd rather have a process. Yeah. If I can only have one, I want a, pro- a process. And that process is, if something's going on, call HR. Or, you know what? Call security. I'm okay with either one of those because I know it's that they're going to call the other. And as long as security and HR talk to each other, solve problems, bring people to the table, we're in a good spot. We good. are out of time. That's unbelievable. Wow. Yes. Why so fast? Pat, Very quick. tell us how we get hold of you. Well, you can always reach me at workplaceviolenceconsultants.com at info at Prince Phelps. Or you, you know what? You can always email me directly, Patrick Prince or at sbcglobal.net. Uh, and what's Keep- your personal phone number? Uh, oh, three one zero four five four zero nine two six, or 
send me an email at chuck at securityguyradio.com, and we'll uh, forward the information to Pat for you. Pat, thank you very much. I know you're very busy, and we really appreciate you coming. It really has been a pleasure. We'll see you next Cheers. week on Security Guy Radio. Tally Cheers. ho. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.